Chapter 6, A Conversation Regarding Relevance Space is vast. An unproductive statement, almost a tautology. And although tautologies can be worthy thought exercises, they become virtually meaningless when it comes down to the actual transmission of information. I believe it is for that reason most beings don't use them in day-to-day -day parlance. The lives of the many are far too volatile and instinct-driven to want to waste time with saying that which is already true. Tautologies are, in general, reserved for stories, for narrative device, for finding new and inventive ways to tell an audience that which they already know. And at the end of the day, are not all diffusions of knowledge at least somewhat tautologist in nature? In order to recognise the value of my words, you must first know what they mean. You must predict my intentions. But I digress. Arguments with my brother would often dissolve into such nonsense. The shouting of truths back at each other, neither of us ever able to convince the other of the righteousness of our stance. We were never meant to agree. It isn't in our blood. Space is vast. Everyone knows it. But most sentient beings in their many universes never have any way or reason to experience it firsthand. Even in societies advanced enough for spaceflight, most people will never leave their atmosphere. When they scoff at my tautology, space is vast, what do they really know? Nothing. As far as any of them have experienced, space does not exist. Very few have stood and looked into the abyss, the true gulf of nothingness that spreads out around the single point of consciousness adrift in a constellation. All the combined weight of sentient endeavour would quail underneath that sheer, irresistible truth. The realisation that they are so small, that the universe cares about their puny lives so very little. Sitting in the glowing light of the stars, this becomes even more apparent. Are we out of orange juice? Are you talking to me? Because if you are, I'd like to remind you that I hate orange juice! No, you don't. Well, I guess I never really had a strong opinion on it before. But now, I can't stand it! It's all you drink! I like the pulp. It's my body, and I don't want orange juice! I hate pulp! And I didn't just make that up to spite you! Who wants strings in their juice? I do. Ugh! I realize that Jade's situation is less than ideal from a characterization perspective, but I still politely point out that nobody likes a whiner. Fuck you, Root Calliope, inside my head! From a characterization standpoint, I think you are pedantic, annoying, and just a general huge drag to be around. Why don't you try being possessed by the spirit of some other version of a good friend of yours and float it around a spaceship full of people you love, unable to affect anything or say hello to anyone? Then tell me about whiners. I killed my brother and consumed him. Sounds like a you problem. I suggest to the witch that I have spent untold eons in the void between universes, waiting for the moment I would be needed to prevent the dissipation of reality as we know it. Her appeals to emotion will not help her. I will remain unmoved. Well, I had to watch my boyfriend and my brother die in front of me, on a tiny scaled version of a world that I shrunk for them, and then spend the next three years talking to myself racked with the guilt that I killed them. I remind the witch that my time was in the void, which is far darker and lonelier than a ship full of lizards. I add that it was also eons, a length of time that is, traditionally, far longer than three years. I ask her to excuse my pettiness in pointing it out. You're a member of a species designed for long periods of isolation. I'm a human! Or at least I started out that way. Even if I had the powers of a first guardian, my brain still worked in modules of human pattern recognition. Three years is a long time for a human teenager. I don't care how many of her molecules are made of a god. I point out that this back and forth is becoming childish, and if- Oh my god, stop narrating. 
Who are you even talking to? The audience, of course. Audience? Ugh, this is so annoying. I can't tell if you're being serious. Your voice is impossible to read, and I can't see your face. Oh. Well... Thanks. That's better. Of course. You're right that I'm being silly. And I didn't mean to start a slap fight over who suffered more. Clearly, you've been through a lot more than I could ever possibly imagine. You're the same Callie who talked to me and Jane when we were unconscious back in the game, right? There's just a lot of everybody running around, and I guess I haven't been keeping the internal tally that I should have. Yes, that's correct. But I think it's a very natural thing to be silly when you're used to being able to control your own body, but now can't. I will allow that, yes. So I will stop yelling at you. But I reserve the right to start yelling again in the future if I have a good reason. Okay? That seems fair. Jade looks at me with the face I have looked at in the mirror for the last few months on board this vessel without a name. No one can decide what it should be called, possibly due to the comical nature of its construction. For a while, there was an ongoing list of ideas hanging in the common room. But it quickly devolved into a cluster of more and more obscure memes until one day the knight tore it down in a fit of piqui. Don't ask me to tell you which knight. You know which one. Jade smiles. Dave and Carcat will always be a source of pain for her. A low ache somewhere in her centre of gravity. But she is happy for them. She knows that there is really no other alternative for how to be. They chose each other over her, and they always will. They are the two people who matter to her most in every universe, and that will not change. No matter how much she wishes it would. No matter how- Do you actually know that? Pardon me? Do you actually know that I'm doomed to pine over Dave and Carcat? Across every iteration of reality? Like, can you actually see that? Because you're a space player like I am. I know that you're more powerful than me, but- I don't think you can see other timelines any better than I can. So I think you're just being dramatic. For the audience. Whatever the heck that means. I experience a moment of unease as Jade looks at me. Keeping her out of my thoughts is proving to be more difficult than I had first assumed it would be. I had begun confident that I could keep her consciousness sleeping peacefully inside the shell of her body, tamed and quiescent but she has proved to be more irascible than I initially gave her credit for. <laughs> I have never been particularly tameable, and my consciousness is huge. You're a pretty tough crowd, Evil Callie. But yes, I can hear most of what you're thinking to yourself. It took a little while to separate it from my own thoughts, just like it did with Dirk because that's what he was doing the whole time, wasn't it? Controlling our thoughts. Making us believe things we never would. Things he thought we should believe. Ah, uh, and here we are. I had been wondering when we would get to the prince, and Jade's knowledge of the chaos he has wrought within this timeline, and who knows how many others. I assume she realizes exactly how many resources the prince put into keeping her still and asleep firmly out of the game, so as to prevent granting me access to the universe in order to foil his campaign of endless hubris. Jade knows all of this, I don't have to tell her. She is a very bright girl, and even if she didn't have partial access to my thoughts, she is good at compiling data and using it to fill in gaps, as she herself had rather licentiously mentioned, her brain is quite large. And all of these reasons are why I know I can count on her to be reasonable and realistic about her situation. I need a body to continue interfacing with this timeline, and her body is the only one that will do. I hear her wonder, what about Kanaya? What about Kanaya? D hey! What about her, Jade? She is a space player, it is true, but her powers are nothing compared to yours. For one, she isn't god tier, and for two, she is dead. A living dead, but dead nonetheless. And a sylph's specialisations lie on a different end of the spectrum from my own. A witch is a far closer match. No, Jade understands and sympathises with my assurance that her body, 
and her body alone will do for my purposes. Um, no I don't. She does. After all, she would not wish this sort of state of being on anyone else, and especially not on one of her friends. Jade may have undergone a lopsided number of narrative hardships in her life, but at least she is used to them. Why spread that suffering to another? Jade understands and accepts her place in the story, which has always been to enable events to play out around her, just as it has been mine. Because what is a story, truly? Nothing but a series of misadventures and connections, actions spurring reactions, tumbling into one another, over and over and over. With so many competing interests, clearly the story cannot account for all perspectives, for all threads. It would be laughable, childish, even selfish, to demand that they do. In other words, not everyone will achieve a happy ending. This is a truth that Jade had come to grips with a long time ago. Wait! Stop! Why are you saying all of this? Jade's body is my vessel. And it is through this realisation that she will understand her true role in the story. Her true relevance. If I released my hold on her consciousness, there would be no guarantee that I would be allowed in again. Therefore, I cannot permit her the control of herself that she so desperately craves. And she understands that. Wait. So... You could give me my body back? And then just hop back in when you need to? In theory, yes. Then what the hell, Callie? Because I don't trust you to cooperate when the time comes. Why not? I thought you said I was a reasonable girl with a huge brain. You are, to an extent. She is. But the truth of the matter remains that humans are capricious and emotional. And even Jade herself could admit that she hasn't been the most committed example of her species in the last few years. What is that supposed to mean? Moving from lover to lover job to job, interest to interest. Over the last few years, Jade had found herself listless, unable to settle and unwilling to commit to anything or anyone. She knows there's nothing wrong with that on a moral level, but on a personal level, she's always believed that she could be more, could do better, be better. And now, because of this, she realizes that sacrifices must be made, and that she, as a space player, is uniquely built for sacrifice. Yeah, I guess you're right. I have been such a silly little slut. Hey, Callie. Yes, Jade? Oh my god, what's that? She points off into the darkness. It's nothing, of course. There is nothing here beside the two of us. This space is utterly under my control. Jade could control it too if she had any access to her own powers, but with my grip around her cortex, there is no chance of that. I know there is nothing behind me. She is being silly, but I'm not Dirk Strider. I don't mind indulging the whims of silly girls if it makes them feel better about their situations. There is nothing wrong with humoring. Ah! And here I make my ah! first mistake. Up until this point, I have counted on my superior narrative power and class strength to keep her under control, but bringing her into a place where we can both physically manifest has left me foolishly vulnerable. When you are dealing with an epically powerful space player and former borderline omnipotent being, you forget that even with her power stripped, she's still quite a formidable physical force. A young woman in the prime of her life, with a canine's instincts and the fierce desire to sink her teeth into something she can tear apart. And right now that something happens to be me. Her fingers tear at my throat, trying to find purchase. She won't be able to kill me here, but it is certainly unpleasant, and not to mention slightly repetitive. We just saw this in the previous chapter, although this particular fight will not end as amorously as the last one did. So don't get your hopes up. Who are you talking to? During the ship's trip through space, there have been numerous experiments modifications to the nutrition output of the various machines designed to create sustenance for the various species on board. I myself have been content with orange juice and synthetic proteins, but Dave and Roxy had both expressed longing for various Earth snacks, and so the trials and errors began. The results were mixed. As Roxy told us in the previous chapter, 
alchemized food all sort of tastes the same, although the visuals really help to bring about the flavor. And at the end of the day, isn't it the journey that is more important than the destination? The stories you tell as you create the strangely flavored nutritional paste? <laughs> so far, everyone's favorite attempt has been a vaguely peanut butter and chocolate flavored creation called Rices. Nobody eats them really. They just sit in a bowl on the counter. I'm not actually sure what the witch is trying to accomplish here. You don't? Really? I don't know what she is trying to accomplish, because surely she would not be doing what it appears she is trying to do. Making such a meaningless threat. Meaningless? Do you even know anything about the body you stole? Shouldn't you have run some sort of psychic physical before you possessed it? It's definitely what I would have done. Jade must know that I am well aware of her family-wide peanut allergy. A story thread that has been extremely important and weighed in on, on multiple parts of the narrative. How could I have forgotten such a key detail? But of course Jade knows that. She is just being silly and dramatic. She knows that a suicide threat is utterly meaningless when made by a god. There is nothing remotely just or heroic about dying from a self-imposed anaphylactic shock in the throes of a childish tantrum. At the most, I'll get a relaxing few minutes of sleep. Do you really want to risk it? What are you talking about, Jade? I just said... I don't know, Callie. I've never really understood the rules that govern the death of a god tier. Have you? It seems pretty arbitrary from where I'm standing. Who makes the decision whether or not something is heroic? Or just? That's unclear. But it certainly isn't you. Right. Of course not. But are you so confident that you're a good guy? Are you sure that the Alpha Timeline wants you to be here? What? You've done some stuff, Callie. I'm only saying you shouldn't be so quick to assume that me killing you wouldn't be just, and that taking my own life to do it wouldn't be heroic. I don't let the witch manipulate me. I refuse to falter in the face of her whispers. Without my careful planning and swift action, the prince would have taken full control over this timeline. None of my friends could even begin to imagine the turmoil. They aren't your friends! You took them from me! Do you really think that any of them would side with you over me? You keep saying that you're doing all of this for my own good. But you're just lonely. I know you are, because so am I. If you are so utterly convinced of your virtue, then let me do this. You said that being a space player is all about sacrifice. Well, bet.